uh, I spoke to a young Hiddink who introduced me, and uh, he suggested, or asked me if I had any suggestions about a piece that would kind of fit into this environment, this kind of more avant-garde experimental environment. And uh, I was really kind of sympathetic with his approach to it, and the, the whole of the kind of sonic acts uh, supporting, really, because the whole point of the project seemed to be to bring an audience into an environment that wouldn't otherwise enter that kind of space. And so I, I come from a kind of uh, do the best as you can when you play the piano kind of background and try and make, you know, the best of the sort of kind of tools you've got. I can't actually read. I read music when I was about 11 or 12. And I, you could test me now. It would probably take me half an hour to read a little, little uh, tiny ABC piano piece or something. But uh, with this piece, uh, I had various kind of uh, approaches to it. I had to kind of think through in my head. And I've read quite a lot about Stockhausen's work and the kind of ideas and so on. And I chose this hymn, and I certainly don't, I don't know how many people here know the word hymn, and I, I, I've only sort of, I've had it for about five years, the actual piece in question, but I've never actually studied it in the sense of, when I say study, I mean actually read through the notes, read through the, the kind of a biography. And I can see all these connections with my work. It sounds kind of arrogant to say connections with my work, Stockhausen and me, but by no means. But last year on the, uh, the BBC in England, and also the Wire magazine, which is quite a popular uh, music magazine, they did a feature, and uh, the BBC commissioned this five-day program called The Music Machine. And I had this ridiculous phone call where somebody from the BBC rang me up and said, would you send a 20-minute dat tape to Stockhausen? Which I kind of thought was a joke. I mean, it's not the kind of thing. You, know, you, should, you don't usually get somebody ringing up saying, well, Tarantino's on the phone. He wants to do the new film with you, Robin, or anything like that. So it was kind of slightly absurd, it seemed, at the time, because I thought this is a, a very respected musical figure and somebody that has been in the, you know, kind of... Uh, Created music scene for about you know 30 or 40 years and doing the most extraordinary work with kind of the sonic architecture of sound and so on, and so that kind of spurred me at the back of my mind as well. And I was kind of inspired by the fact he was so enthusiastic about my work. He talked about some of the other artists in a slightly more, or slightly less you know, pleasant way, and I came out sort of the best. He didn't like it, didn't absolutely love it, but he, he gave me some ideas to sort of spur me on with his piece and. Uh, what I'm going to kind of just talk through now very briefly, I'm going to talk for about maybe 15, 20 minutes and give you the opportunity for questions and so on. Uh, and what you heard at the beginning, I should say, is just a tiny excerpt. What I'm actually doing tonight is I've actually got like a big sample with lots of samples and sounds I've kind of reprocessed and kind of uh, deconstructed in some sense. So what you were hearing just now is one sound that I've kind of played at different pitches and kind of processed it slightly. And it's one tiny excerpt from Hymnon, the actual... Uh, old uh, record release, the old Decca release I've got, and uh, somebody just loaned me hidden on, on a CD and you get kind of two different versions of it. You also get a, a very handsome booklet with it that goes through the kind of theories behind it and so on. And so uh, I just wanted to sort of reach out here in some sense and try and explain from my kind of slightly naive point of view what I was trying to do and whether it works or not obviously is dependent upon you as a, you as a, a passive listener in some sense. And this opportunity is a, is a small chance for me to kind of try and talk through the work and as other people probably know, it's not until you actually start talking about something that kind of makes some sense and you come out with some kind of structure. So, in the actual booklet, uh, Stockhausen was talking about bridges and uh, between pieces, and it's kind of used the phrase flood of sound. And in the actual booklet, I've got a quote here, it's this kind of low distorted tone that hisses and hovers over the regions. And uh, the, the piece hymnon, in, in one sense, it, it uses a lot of... Uh, National anthems. If you haven't heard the piece, it's, it's quite recognisable. Lots of the, the elements of it, because suddenly uh, the internationality of something will suddenly appear, and you suddenly think, I know this tune really well. And these kind of uh, these elements will keep breaking through. And with the work I've been doing, I've been using conversations, and I've been travelling quite a lot in the last sort of two or three years, and I've always recorded in the local area. With my work, I've, I've used this kind of a uh, generic phrase, which is like map in the city or kind of sound Polaroid. So when I've been doing concerts, for, for example, if I record or do a show in Amsterdam, a lot of the sound source I use is taken from the kind of ether, the radio waves of Amsterdam. If I travel to Tokyo, I use the sound from Tokyo and so on. And what I've done over the last couple of years is actually compiled an archive of these recordings, just like street sounds and so on. It's fairly you know, a common thing for lots of musicians to do. But also using intimate conversations between individuals in these different countries. And so... I, I call these the kind of regions of the piece, and instead of using national anthems, I would use different accents, different dialects, and also different uh, languages completely. And the kind of the fun element of it, in some way, the way hymnon works is suddenly 
shortwave radio parts will break through and you'll recognize part of a theme from a, a tune or something. And the way this work, hopefully for me is working at least, is that a voice will break through and as soon as you hear maybe a Dutch voice, your ear tunes through to it. If I played it to somebody who was French, they were suddenly tuning to the French voice and so on. And uh, he talks about the subjective, subjective center of the piece, which I, had, I was trying to see as myself. I had to, if you're a composer or an artist, it's obviously a very subjective drink, excuse me. Uh, I'm the subjective centre of it in some sense, and so I'm the kind of English voice in it in some way. Trying to negotiate, trying to navigate the different voices, the different textures, the different tones, and so on. And uh, what appealed to me was the actual openness of the score. I know, as I keep emphasising, I'm not actually a trained musician, so there wasn't a score for me to read. If there was a score for me to read, I probably wouldn't have been able to interpret it in, in a certain way. And what, I must emphasise this isn't a version of him, though. What I was pointing out was two of the pieces that I personally like are Stockhausen's. I took this and there was another piece, Gold Dust, which is an absolutely exquisite piece, really beautiful, very, very peaceful record. Uh, and I took a couple of parts from that as well, but there was another quote that he uses from the, from the liner notes to the CD, where he says, the openness of the score of the pieces for radio, television, opera, ballet, recording, concert hall, church, and out of doors. And that kind of appealed to me that it wasn't it, this, the piece of hymnal wasn't written towards a certain uh, audience in a way. It wasn't written towards a certain this kind of cliche image one might have of uh, what classical audience look like. I mean, we all have these kind of images of what traditional avant-garde concert audiences look like, pop audiences, club audiences, techno, and so on. And I come from more techno-related stuff. Almost by default, I do sort of more dance orientated records and so on. And this project, excuse me, the piece map in Stockhausen is by no means a kind of techno project, it's actually using a lot of the sounds from the piece in them, the piece Gold Dust and also Contactor, and kind of recontextualizing it in a more kind of 30 minute compact version because uh, one of the, the kind of rules of the game tonight is the fact that I move in 30 minutes from the avant-garde through to the kind of the more accessible dance scene. So I've got this kind of 30 minutes like a little sort of a mini marathon I have to run through and sort of hit the beats at the end of something. Uh, and there's a, there's a the, the other element I found very appealing was the found objects in the actual piece of uh, the actual recording of him. There's a lot of speech, there's crowd noises, there's conversations, there's shortwave radio demonstrations, recording of a Chinese shop and so on. And the work I've been doing over the, the years of Scanner, I, I can see myself, I can see connections with this in the way that I like using a lot of found sound. It certainly is unusual, again, as I say, for an artist or a musician, whether you're a, a sculptor or whether you're a photographer and so on, you use a lot of visual images you pick up from, from seeing other people's work from the street, from television, from other media culture, and so on. But what appealed to me was the fact that he was using a lot of what I, I kind of call debris in a way. The sort of stuff that when you're in the studio you try and get rid of. And I read a, a, little, a little sort of narrative in there that says that in the actual piece you hear a lot of Stockhausen's voice himself. He puts himself in as the kind of, not centre, but there's this element of the composer still being there. You hear him breathing at certain points during the piece. And what I kind of liked was the fact that part of the work I've been doing is this kind of a, I get called like a telephone terrorist and all these ridiculous kind of aggressive sounding things, but is surreptitiously listening to other things you're not supposed to listen to in some sense. And so I kind of like the, the appeal was the fact that in this piece Stockhausen didn't realise he was being recorded first of all by one of his colleagues. And, <coughs> excuse me, uh, when he discovered, he said, great, let's, let's kind of you know, incorporate it into the piece. And so what you hear during the actual composition, that when you hear it played back, is elements of Stockhausen's voice appearing back, saying various phrases like, that sounds good, or okay, or shit, that's terrible, and this kind of stuff. And I kind of like, personally, I like that personal element reintroduced into the, into the piece. And that's what I've actually enjoyed about Stockhausen's work, the work I like, is that kind of introduction, that personal element. But having said this, I probably know well kind of four or five Stockhausen pieces, and I mean, the catalogue is phenomenal, it's such a huge amount of work, and for this piece I could have chosen another composer, I could have chosen another artist to go with, but I was listening to him then at the point when Jan Hiddink rang me up, and I thought, well this kind of fits in in some sense, there must be more connections than I didn't realise, and so what's now you will hear is kind of a, a 30 minute piece of building layers of sound, building, I can play you if people are interested, you know, any more excerpts from it, that's kind of what you were hearing, as I said, is just put one layer, it's kind of one filtered sound that's kind of processed and built up in different textures, like a sort of architectural piece or something. And it builds through, and the last piece 
whether it's going to be controversial or not, I've actually written uh, a kind of drum and bass style uh, pattern where I've actually taken samples from Contacta using bass drums and snare drums and pitched them high and low and try to create something with some real sense of movement because I'm just aware tonight in some sense, this is a cry of sellout probably, I don't know, but I'm just aware that with an audience who maybe aren't so accustomed to hearing avant-garde or experimental music, and this is what I see appealing about tonight, I think it's quite important, the element of repetition, the element of structure, in the sense of simple repetitive beats. And that's not to say you need a 4-4 time kick drum going on and on or anything like that, but you can actually, with, with drum and bass, which is a very inspiring form of a composition, it's particularly in the UK, some amazing stuff been coming out, where you can take a simple drum pattern, and there's a lot of kind of cut and paste element between different rhythms, different beats, and so on. And whether you like it or not, it's a phenomenal sort of original approach to playing with kind of rhythm structure and so on. Whether you can dance to it is another thing, it's another challenge in some way, you know. So whether people actually dance in the last kind of five minutes or not, who knows? And it's kind of a could be a positive challenge, you know, I really don't know. But I kind of don't want to talk too much anymore about it in some sense. The piece is, is relatively straightforward. It moves through five different regions. And that moves from kind of very abstract, gentle tones through to a more kind of, a, as I say, more drama based, more aggressive closure to the piece. And I actually recorded a session for VPRO, which might be slightly more representative of the piece because the only problem with playing in a venue like the Paradiso or any grand venue is it's a great audience, it's a great space, but you lose any of the kind of subtleties. And the idea of the piece is there's some very, very gentle textures in it, some very gentle tones. But unfortunately, with, a, with an audience there as well, in that kind of environment, you need to pump up the volume. And with that volume going up and the PA system, there's the chance that it's going to distort slightly. You're going to lose those kind of tiny intricate elements that are quite important to the piece. So if anybody gets a chance, this isn't necessarily an advert for it, but also if people aren't coming tonight, this is both an opportunity to tune in the radio and hear kind of another version of it, you know, kind of version I just did in the studio yesterday. Uh, maybe that's all I should say at the moment. Just open it up see if anybody had any questions or anything. We have like a... We've got up until about six o'clock, so uh, we're kind of we don't have all the time in the world, but enough for lots of questions. If anybody has anything particularly they want to ask about it, and I've been kind of general about the piece here. There might be something particular people want to ask about it. I'm not sure, but I mean maybe people put their hands up and I can just kind of attempt to uh, give some answer. Back up. First yeah. question: What's your politics? What are my politics? In what sense? Sorry. Well, you're using a, a piece like Himmon, which is you know basically. National anthems are the projection of the nation state, yeah. which is a pretty sort of fundamental uh, political statement. I'm asking you about your politics. Well, it's, I mean, to be quite honest, and this is a, a very, not candid, but it's a, in a, on a personal level, it's kind of, I didn't actually vote until four years ago uh, in England. This wasn't uh, from kind of being a, a really rough anarchist or anything like that. It's kind of, I didn't actually know the political party would ever appeal to me, to be quite honest. It never, always, when I grew up, I kind of was curious that why would you vote for this party when this party could do, you know, would, would somebody would do something good for education, somebody would cut this thing, and so on. I could never see it. I'm saying it very, very simple about this. Mm -hmm. But with the piece, Himmon, I, I was trying to reflect on the elements of the, the not a nationalistic approach, which is why I'm trying to avoid the problem I always have with kind of performance is the is the ego element, and it's something that I have a personal problem with, which is there's a figure up there who is the composer, and I'm not somebody who's playing a score of somebody else's work. It's actually my piece that I've put together. And it's an element, it's a, it's a problem I've often had, and I always often want to just disappear and kind of hide at the side and kind of let this thing play, maybe with some visual element playing and so on. So this, there's all the kind of national voices going on. There's quite a, there's quite a huge collection of, kind of New York and Japanese and so on accents feeling. And whether, I'm kind of apolitical in some sense, and I don't know whether you know, this is going to be a controversial element. I hadn't probably considered the, the kind of political approach to it. There's no, the, well, you've answered my question. Yeah. That's not, that's, that's not an important issue. Yeah. But do you think that uh, it was for Stockhausen when you made it? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I don't know how other people feel about Stockhausen or how well they know the work, but he kind of, in some sense, he kind of scares me in a way. You kind of hear these stories about him quite of being sort of almost a, a totalitarian or something. I don't know Megalomania. about that. Yeah, it's quite, I mean, it's quite funny. He sounds like quite an eccentric, but we need eccentrics to kind of move different movements along and so on. Mm -hmm. So, I don't know, I've never met up with him as such, but the stories, when they came back from the BBC when they told me the stories about meeting up with him. It was so amazing and so funny. Uh, I couldn't quite believe it. You know, extremely funny. Oh, man. They don't want to hear it. They want to hear it first. And then... 
that's the advantage that people haven't heard it yet, so I can escape a bit. <coughs> people don't write things down necessarily. So how do you determine the quality of conversation? Is every conversation usable or well, with, with this piece, what I what I would usually do when I edit or like uh, as any kind of <coughs> creative person would do is kind of they choose pieces, uh, they, they listen to work, or they, they view film they've produced and so on. And they were edits in some sense, they were kind of processed in some way. And that's what I usually do with conversations or voices or sound up archive, whether it's me on the street recording something going on. And I would, out of my own personal vision or whatever, I would choose this sound over this sound, this voice over this voice, and so on. And so for this, I try to be a bit more, not careless isn't the right word, because that means almost means that you don't, you're not taking paying attention or anything. But I, I quite deliberately did kind of a live mix of like about, about 20 different uh, languages. And within each of those languages, there's different dialects. So with, with Flemish, for example, I've been in Belgium, Rotterdam, Utrecht, Amsterdam, and so on. So there's this kind of accents. And the kind of interesting thing for me as well for anybody is that you can't cheat with some of these things. I can't secretly spend an evening in Rotterdam I think I can play the tape of the voice that I played in Rotterdam. Because people recognise dialects, and you kind of, until you start doing work like this, you forget that it's very local to the area. It's kind of, it's very reflective of that environment, of that city, of that town, or whatever. And so, with this piece, I've produced this kind of 30-minute kind of collage in some sense, which I'm going to be mixing in various intervals of, uh, as I say, these 20 different accents or 20 different uh, uh, languages. Sorry, the chat here. Yeah. Maybe I got the answer there, but no, no, I thought of something else. Uh, if, if this project is very much connected up to, to Stockhausen, which is for those very yeah. personal reasons for you, but um, how would one move on from this project? I mean, would you map the barrier? Or I don't know, it sounds, I mean, it sounds ridiculous, doesn't it? It's almost like, kind of a, it's like you have a sort of process, and it's kind of like, what shall I do? Let's do mapping bath this week or something. That sounds like those kind of horrible hooks on classics, you know? It's kind of, you know books on hiding or something. Remember, but no, I won't be doing that. But this is a very particular project. I don't usually get commissioned pieces. The only other piece I'm doing that relates to this is I'm doing a version of Fontana mixed by John Cage in London in November. That, I can see a reflection there in the sense that that event is at a place called the Royal Festival Hall, and, uh, which, which is a very kind of establishment venue. It's where you go and hear opera and you hear classical music quite a lot of the time. And as a percentage of the, the programme, it's jazz music and pop music and world music. And what's interesting about that event, which kind of relates to this, is that they have bands like Elastica, this English pop band, uh, attempting to do a Le Mans Young piece. Uh, band Stereo Lab, who are another English sort of pop guitar band, are doing like a Terry, uh, Terry Riley piece, I think it is. And it's a kind of extraordinary uh, collection of bodies being invited to do this project. And part of the point of it is, and I see this connection here, maybe I'm you know, being too enthusiastic, but I think it's really exciting to kind of introduce people to new styles of music. And I know a lot of people, I've got a friend, David Toop, who's a, a writer, but also a musician. And when we first met, it was a really healthy point, because there was a point when so-called ambient music, and this horribly sort of generic term I have to use here, was suddenly becoming very big about four or five years ago. And it was enough that his work was being more accepted by the kind of, a, a kind of popular press in some sense. And it was a really important moment, I think, that kind of opened a lot of people's ears and eyes up. You know, In fact, you can go to any standard record shop now in London, I can go to like a big version of store and have a lot more kind of abstract, avant-garde work than you'd ever have had kind of five years ago. Because there was kind of almost a, an intellectual environment opened up for people in some sense. And they were listening to kind of techno. The thing that appealed to me about techno was the fact you'd have very abstract textures going on quite often with these kind of full-on beats to be dancing to. But there was no traditional song structure. There was no traditional kind of tune sometimes even, but it was actually quite a positive thing I found. Yeah. Um, I remember in that uh, one edition when Mr. Yeah. Krause made his comments on uh, the music of you and I believe on uh, so two other guys? He did a, he did a the Apex Twin, Richard Jones, yeah, did a Richie Horton, this Canadian DJ producer couple of other people. He made this comment that he didn't like those two repetitive uh, aspects and he made this, yeah. this comparison that he 
to someone who is stuttering and found it as worth out of his mouth. What do you think of such a comment? Yeah, it's one thing I've always been, it's one thing I quite disagree with. It's one of the most kind of strongest things he said. It's like, he played a, if anybody knows the work of Richie Horton, it's very minimal, it's really like, you can't like it because it's very hypnotic, very minimal kind of structured beats over a very simple kind of bass pattern. There's no sense of melody quite often, just these kind of patterns building up and up in structure. And uh, he hated it. He said, this sort of music is designed for dance bars. And he kind of gave away this kind of, you know, this out of touch element because he, he said that this music is designed for dance bars, which in fact it is. You know, that is the point of that, you know, a lot of that kind of music and so on. But I think it's a, re repetition can be a very attractive uh, tool to use. It can be very seductive in a sense because it can draw you into a piece quite easily. And I know, I mean, I've been to a number of concerts where you listen to an abstract piece of music, for me as a listener, as a passive listener, an abstract piece that goes on for like five hours or something, I've been to performances, and at some point you're kind of craving for some sense of, maybe I'm sounding too traditionalist in a sense, but like a, I'm not asking for like, like some, you know, 4-4 four, four pattern or something, but even the implication of rhythm in some sense, and it can even be a pattern that only repeats every 30 seconds or something. But, you know, I personally find that my brain kind of tunes into it, draw me into it in quite a, as I say, seductive manner. And I don't know, it's, it's, it's the one thing I find difficult listening is, is it can be very abstract pieces that kind of clatter away in some sense. This is a very personal element, this is, you know, I'm sounding very controversial here, but that's the, the kind of stuff I find most difficult to uh, empathise with or digest can be work that I can find no kind of structure in my own head to kind of work through or something. Maybe that's a good thing in some sense. Maybe that teaches you to work harder at it, I, you know, don't deny it. But weren't you surprised that from a man like Schrepphausen uh, that he was, uh, he was the way of the fact that uh, with this kind of music, his first music, that, that doesn't change. So yeah. it was his dogma that music has to change yeah. from a man who has... Yeah, it's quite ironic, yeah, of course it is, yeah. I just, I mean, obviously, he's in his own... His own castle, mm -hmm. his own world, he's in his own castle. He's kind of a. Of course, with age. Yeah, it looks like. I don't know. I mean, you know, there's, it's, it's not always a generational thing. And the thing that's kind of appealed to me about the, <laughs> the liberation of the kind of ambient techno thing is there's kind of no age barriers in some sense. I run a, a club, a space in London. There is no, it's not designed for girls and baby tees and boys and fancy little baggy pants. It's for anybody to go along to. It's a really kind of healthy environment. You know, and that's the thing that's kind of appealed to me. Particularly about, I mean, I've always listened to kind of a lot of experimental kind of electronic avant-garde stuff over the years, and to see people, fairly big kind of you know techno names, putting things like that in their charts and listening to it or DJing with it, which has happened quite a lot in England, I noticed at clubs, people will play, you know, the most you know, as an arc is being played in a kind of club, for example, you know, it's a fantastic thing to happen. Um, yeah. What we see like. In past year is a lot of these sort of projects trying to bridge popular music and, and, and sort of serious music. And um, you're sort of getting this sort of avant pop sort of trend. And um, well, my first question is, I, I, we haven't heard the piece and I don't know your music, yeah, but where, where do you expect your music to be heard and what do you think about this new sort of, uh, like, you know, you have this uh, dance music getting more and more like um, sort of avant-garde and, um, and you say like your piece that on, one, on one hand it's like you miss a lot of sort of nuances uh, in, yeah. you know, like in a, in a disco sort of like a disco. So what's your vision, vision of like this new sort of trend or what do you think about that it's sort it's of grey area? It's a great question, question really as well, isn't it? It's kind of how you kind of predict a sound being moved into, you know, which environment. What interests me is the, something I've been thinking about recently is the way that, how we listen to music and the way that in the last 15 years, we've actually started listening to music in a different way because 15 years ago, the Sony Walkman was just sort of being introduced and we listened to music at home. And I'm 32 now. When I was about sort of uh, 14 or 15, I really listened to records in a very intense fashion. I actually did that sad kind of thing where you'd switch the lights out, you'd actually listen to a record. And you, you kind of learn this piece inside out. And what kind of has interested me is the way that people kind of listen to sound more environmentally now. They take sound can be, you can take sound with you wherever you go. They've been very interested in the way that we passively kind of digest 
uh, that sound, the way that we actually can take music with us to any kind of environment. You can sit on a plane, whenever you travel on a plane now, you can take sound with you. You can take, if they have a... You know, it's making it become sort of a noise, like you have it in supermarkets, elevators... Yeah, I agree in some sense. The yeah. thing is, like, is it music sort of losing its um, sort of attention by the audience? I don't know, I'm trying to be as positive as possible and think it's a, any opening up of any kind of event, anything that can engage an audience to listen to something they wouldn't otherwise listen to. It's weird how you, as an individual, your perception changes over the years, obviously. I mean, even with like television and advertising, the way that television in England, I don't actually get some of the adverts sometimes, you'll see them, I don't understand what they're advertising. You know, it's, it's extraordinary, the kind of language is so sophisticated now, it's gone beyond any kind of meaning and so on. And we're a very visual, visually literate now. And I read a disturbing statistic recently where children at schools now, don't, uh, they, have, they, they read much slower than they used to because they actually look at it as blocks, as visual blocks. They don't read it as text. And I find that kind of disturbing statistic in some sense that we're, we're becoming a very visual culture like that. I know I'm not talking about music here, but I'm kind of, I keep finding these kind of connections with sort of visual aesthetic and hearing aesthetic and so on. But I think that kind of appealed to me with, with my own recording, there's been this kind of walk on culture. And I've been working on pieces that are very, very peaceful. <coughs> I kind of like the idea that when you use a Walkman to listen to music, you, you start hearing the environment. You start hearing trams going by. You hear people walking by. And I like working with uh, trying to place sound in certain areas, trying to put like a little voice over there. So you're listening to this piece, but you don't know whether it's somebody talking behind you on the bus, but it's actually on the piece or not. And it kind of links back to the way I suddenly realised that I became interested in incorporating voices into music. It was in 1980, Brian Eno released an album called On Land. Excuse me. I don't know if anybody knows this album. It's actually one of my favourite albums. It's almost like environmental recordings or kind of uh, sound photographs of Cornwall, a place that Brian Eno as an artist really liked and wanted to kind of reproduce on a record or on a compact disc. And I bought the record when I was like 15 or 16 years old. And I went home and put the record on. And what I really loved about the record was, in the background you could hear these tiny, tiny voices. And I listened to it, and I just, I loved the element of like, the almost kind of dissipating, almost disappearing, just like a sort of, a mist or something that would be there and then disappear again. And uh, I was so excited about this record. And I put it on a couple of days later and the voices weren't there. And it's kind of like, shit. What's happened? Is that, I don't take drugs, I don't drink, what's going on? But actually, it was the time when CB radio was really popular. And what my amplifier at home was picking up was somebody on a CB radio around the corner going, Roger Copy, I want a cup of tea, or whatever people talk about. <laughs> these kind of things. But I kind of, I suddenly realised quite recently that that was quite an important element for me, the way that that kind of, that chance encounter, that, that kind of occasion happening, was quite a spark, obviously, at the back of my little creative mind, you know, for doing this kind of work. I mean, sorry, the subject is so big, I'll probably just talk for hours, otherwise I should uh, answer another question. <laughs> if I don't, I'll just carry on that. <laughs> you said to me that a piece you're going to do for the piece and that it goes sometime at the end towards drum and bass. Yeah. How much life is it involved in drum and bass? Like, if you play live, would those bits be moved together live, or is it something which is already taped? The, the entire piece tonight, uh, it's 30 minutes long. Apart from the last part, there's just a, there's a rhythm pattern on that which I can't physically play live. It's, uh, it's the what I, what I kind of enjoy. The thing that initially appealed to me about drum and bass. I don't know if everybody here even, you know knows what drum and bass records sound like. I certainly wouldn't want to assume it. But uh, what appealed to me was the fact that digital technology has enabled us to create sound that we'd never otherwise be able to create, and visuals, and so on, and computer work, and etc. You know, etc. Cetera, et cetera. And drum and bass was a genre of music kind of is, was born because, not because, but due to the advent of like sampling. And there's no way you can physically play those drum breaks. There's like... Nobody's playing that. The, people do play them, but some of the, some of the sounds are so, <coughs> so extraordinarily fast. I mean, where people, there'll be a drum break that goes like, like this, but like even faster and incredible. And so what, what's exciting about it for, for me when you compose music is, is hearing kind of genre of music evolving over the last four or five years, like drum and bass in England, when it began, began on kind of pirate radio stations and, and so on. And 
I kind of, I find it so exciting, the, these kind of, the, the appeal of this kind of, the, the kind of frenetic speed of this sort of work. And so, you're right, tonight I can't physically play, I've only got ten fingers, you see, and if I had kind of more, I'd probably be trying to do it. If there's two of you, you can try and do it. I do a, I do a separate project which involves those kind of aspects, and you can play it live. And in England, there's a couple of clubs where people play live drums, live percussion for drum and bass. But I'm not sure, uh, you know, with, with some of the work, would it actually ever exist without... I, I do think, I think if you have some kind of um, different sample of beats... No, it's all... That, that no, it's all... Get a lamp or no, it's, it's nobody else's. It's, it's no, like... Uh, what I've done is kind of map sounds over a keyboard with, with a sampler. So every key reflects a certain sound. What I do live as well is I pitch them all live and kind of uh, filter them. Just take, so there'll be a sound playing, but you don't hear it. You just feel it. Just open the filter up and close it and so on. And uh, it's very simple, really. It's kind of a, it's not a really good musician, but I'm trying my best. <laughs> uh, but but see, I can play a tiny excerpt. You can hear what it, you know, you can hear kind of what it would sound like slightly. And you can hear the way I've kind of just uh, taken the beats. And this is a. Uh, <laughs> Keep up. 